So welcome, everybody. And, and welcome, those of you that are out there in the digital world. Um, we're very happy to be able to have this hybrid event to kind of contextualize the festival, have an opportunity to talk more and deeper with these artists. I'm sorry for those of you at home, you don't get to come see these beautiful shows, but there is a beautiful online mini um, film festival of puppetry. And these are puppet pieces that were made specifically for the camera. Also, all of you that are here, if you're not satisfied with the, if you're not saturated yet with all the puppetry, you can also um, go watch these beautiful pieces that have been curated by Chad Williams of Wonderspark Puppets. Uh, so please engage. We are here for our first panel of three throughout the festival. There'll be two more next weekend, both at noon on Saturday and Sunday with, again, wonderful panelists that you'll really want to talk more to. Um, and I'll shortly turn this over just to say this is the 11th Puppets in the Green Mountains Festival. This is the third festival in which we are doing more opportunity for these symposium type discussions. And um, we hope it grows from here. And we understand the art is a doorway to, to so many things. And so how, those of you that just came from shows this morning, I, I hope you feel opened for this conversation to hear all these amazing voices sitting behind me. I'm sorry, I'm standing in front of you all. I'll move in a second. Um, Yes, there is uh, someone running the box office outside. If there's still tickets that you want to purchase, you can do so directly there. Um, there's the merch table with our new t-shirts and our new book. So please take one home with you as a souvenir and support the festival in that way. Before we begin, um, I'm actually going to turn things over for a moment to Chrissy, who's right behind me, to, to honor someone very dear to this community who we, who we recently lost and want to call into the space. Thank you. Um, so I'm Chrissy Colombrat, and I'm the, um, uh, one of the co-authors on Parenting for Social Justice. Um, and I want to bring into the space Angela Burkefield, who is the lead author and the brainchild behind Parenting for Social Justice. Um, as Shoshana mentioned, um, Angela was a, um, a big force for, uh, in the area for social change. Uh, and she, um, you know, the inspiration for the book, Parenting for Social Justice, was really a series of um, workshops for parents. Uh, and we uh, lost Angela just almost about a year ago uh, to a fierce battle with cancer. Um, and I want to call her into the space as an ancestor who continues to guide us on that path and who worked fiercely and fearlessly for social change. And um, you know, I, Angela really saw uh, children and our ability to work with children and to have those tough conversations with children as the avenue for building the more just and liberated world that we long for. So I'm just asking that we take a moment of silence um, to honor Angela, but also to bring in the other ancestors in this room who fight for social change, who, who you think of. So take a moment, please. Thank you. It felt really good just to be here with everybody in silence a little bit and everyone sitting with whoever you were sitting with in that moment. Um, so I would like to next introduce Laith Moody, who will be our facilitator, fearless facilitator throughout all three panels. And Laith comes to us, by all means, come on in, <laughs> comes to us by way of the Root Social Justice Center here in Brattleboro. Um, specifically the Youth for Change program, which is really working with youth in the area in exciting ways. So we're, thank you for joining us and taking this on, and I hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you, of course. Um, this is only the second panel I've ever done so far. 
first one. Speak up a little bit, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, this is only the second panel that I've ever done. The first was just this May, also with um, with Sandglass, uh, Delac Brathwaite, who did a, another theater performance on May 7th. That was absolutely incredible. Um, and after that, the Sandglass invited me to work with them on this festival, which I am extremely excited to facilitate. Um, I will now allow you three to introduce yourselves to if anyone has already spent to the, to the shows, I've seen them, probably don't completely need an introduction, but I now pass it to you, all three of you. <laughs> Decide amongst yourselves. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm Katrin Blüchert. Um, I come from Germany, Erfurt, um, which is like in the very middle of Germany, green as well. We have some woods there, we have hills there, so things uh, are comparable. And I'm employed at a puppet theater, public puppet theater. With, uh, I have six colleagues there. And um, yeah, doing puppetry is like my daily work. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, I'm lucky to um, have this uh, piece I was showing here two times today. Yeah, it was great pleasure. And now I'm very interested in this panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Sofia Padilla. I'm from Mexico City, the big concrete jungle. <laughs> and um, I came to this festival with Paradox Teatro, that is a company that I'm the co-artistic director and co-founder. We founded in 2017. And um, we also work with Bread and Puppets. So mm -hmm. coming to Vermont is like coming back to the origin for us of the company. Um, we did a show here last night, and we have another show tonight at 7, mm. if you want to come, our last show, a workshop tomorrow morning, if you want to jump in, trying some sand drawings hands-on, and I'm very, I'm a mom, and that is a big challenge in my life, and I'm very interested in listening to our conversation. As I said, I'm Chrissy Colombrat. Um, I am I'm one of the co-authors in Parenting for Social Justice. I co-wrote the chapter on Parenting for Racial Justice. Um, I'm also, I come at this as an educator. Um, now for, gosh, um, almost 20 years. I can't believe I'm saying that out loud. Um, <laughs> and um, also as a parent. Um, as an educator, I spent much of my time kind of in the, what we call now the DEI space, the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, um, leading conversations with students, but also with faculty and parents, um, and certainly as a parent of three children, three young boys, um, I'm also very much committed and interested in how to help them be the shapers of tomorrow's change. Um, okay, if we can then just like, go straight into questioning. I'd like to begin with you, Chrissy. Okay, great. Um, I know that primarily um, your, like your target, I guess, audience are parents, because that's who you're writing the book for, um, and are trying to affect their children through like suggesting what you want to teach them. But can you talk about hope more on how you directly engage with children outside of your writing? Yeah, sure. Um, so. You know, I certainly I engage with my own children um, and also with the children that I, I work with in schools. Um, a lot of that is really through, um, one, trying to f figure out what children are curious about and interested in. I think um, they are very observant beings and will often um, have lots of thoughts about the world around them and be very curious. And I think that's the perfect entry point. Um, but also thinking about kind of what um, using literature, using using story to kind of bring up conversations with, with children is another way um, that I've often done that with uh, kids. And, and I've been fortunate to work with little guys from like kindergarten, but all the way through high school. Um, and so um, as students get older, um, I find that really listening to what's on their minds, like 
what they're worried about, what they see in the news, what, what they're feeling in their own um, social circles um, is a great entry point for conversations about the kind of worlds that they want to live in and, and why things might be the way they are. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, and then to add to that, like a second question, you were saying that like children are absorbent sponges that take everything yeah. around them, and that includes all like lots of things that maybe you're like, uh, I kind of wouldn't want you to absorb that just yet. Um, and so children will come probably come to you with very difficult questions, which is which relates to what this part of the festival is about, um, yeah. children and tackling very difficult topics. How do you suggest, or how do you in your home? Um, tackle these difficult questions with your children. Yeah, um, for anybody who has kids or works with kids, you know that like they always ask those questions at what feel like the worst time, right? Like when you're like, I'm not ready, I wasn't ready yet. Um, part of that I think is trying to be ever ready as much as I can and that really I think is about having those conversations with other adults in my life myself, mm -hmm. right? Thinking about what is it that I believe about this or how am I understanding this? Really kind of examining that so that when that question comes up, I've got some place to start from. Um, and then, you know, I think it's really being honest with kids. I think sometimes we're afraid to be honest, like really honest about the, the situation of the world. I think there's a way to be sort of honest and, um, the word that comes to mind is sort of discreet, but I just mean really clear. I, you know, I think about like answering the question that you are asked um, and then waiting to see what the next question is. Um, maybe not always filling all of the space with all of the, um, all of your adult thoughts about it, but really at answering the question that's asked. Um, and then seeing where, where kids want to go with that. Um, and naming sometimes, like this is a hard question. These are questions that adults grapple with. Um, and I. I, I'm so glad that you're asking that. I think letting kids know it's okay to ask questions, even when they, because they can sense if we're uncomfortable. So even when that feeling's gonna come up saying like, this is a hard one, and I'm, let's work together, and I'm gonna try to answer your question, and let's have a conversation. Yeah, it certainly reminds me of my mom. Um, usually when I, when I would ask her like a difficult question, or she would like just like start talking to me to, um, or like explaining something to me that she felt I was ready for. She's like, I'm gonna tell you part of this, but there's more that you need to know later yeah. that, I'm, that I'm not going to reveal because you're not old enough just yet. Yeah. Um, and then in like a, in a similar form, um, Catherine and you, Sophia, like in your performances, how like the, the both of your shows were pretty similar in the theme of refugee migrants and their travels and troubles and tribulations, um, which are heavy, those you refugees are leaving from somewhere that you don't wanna be at <laughs> for usually very harsh reasons. And it gets pretty heavy in your shows, but it's also still absorbable. Um, like how, like, how did you develop your ways of making your shows absorbable, yeah. especially for children? Um, do you still want to, um, the, how y'all said at the, at an interview that I had with you, Sophia, on Wednesday, mm -hmm. um, inspire compassion in these youths? Um, yeah, how, how, how did you develop these while making the show? I feel um, it was hard for us to decide when we were creating the show. Um, we had all this board in a whole wall with all these ideas brainstorming about possible scenes. And it was really hard to choose which ones because there's so much stories um, that deserve to be told about migration. Um, so it was hard for us to select which ones and we had this dilemma of we want to be fair to this topic and to all the people that have left their homes forever and this is in honor of them. But how can we do it so that it's not just um, leaving the theater like wanting to jump off a bridge, you know? Like how can we do it in a way that we inspire compassion and bring some hope also? 
at the same time to being fair to these stories, right? So it was a difficult um, trying to find the balance and I feel that same balance is what I always try to find when I'm talking to my kid. And he has all these tough questions about war and migration and all these topics and relationships and all these incredible questions that he has and I'm always like I don't want to I don't want to paint in paint it pink for him because the world has these very hard things as well and I want him to feel prepared for them but at the same time I don't want him to feel hopeless or helpless um, so how to manage those two things and I feel that I always try to approach being honest, like you said, with him, but at the same time, what can we do in our tiny daily life yeah. to change a little bit of that big, heavy thing, um, like war or things that feel very that can make you feel very helpless? Um, so, what can we do from our daily lives in our little um, place, and then that gives me a little hope that he might find, not feel helpless and find a way yeah. to feel that he's, that he can make a difference in his actions and choices every day. So that's how I also approach or try to approach this show when I'm creating, when I was create when we were creating it and the future shows that we are creating as well. Yeah, for us it was um, maybe easier because uh, our show is based on a novel so um, there it was already written you know and was uh, already um, choice was made so um, yeah what what I think is um, I don't have any children myself so but my work is kind of um, or this especially this work is um, like an offer especially for teachers or for adults, for parents, to um, have a um, possibility to deal with this uh, for, uh, yeah, when you're um, an adult, very hard and very dark themes, but, you know, to have it in a way that it could be a tale, it could be a modern uh, little red riding hood, and then from this you could talk with your child about things. Yeah? And um, as I invite uh, the children to be part of the performance, or no, I, I draw, for people who haven't seen it, I draw or let people, I invite people to draw a garden in the beginning. Yeah, like, and everybody is kind of who's drawing is, yeah, I like this flower, and, and they go with a heart, they are there, so they are connected. And then I come and say, I have to leave my home, and then I come with a, I don't know, what is a swoop? A mop. A mop. <laughs> yeah, and I put it away. And of course, that's like, it's a sad moment. Yeah, and so this is, um, yeah, there you can um, uh, get, get a feeling what, what it means to, to leave home and not coming back, and maybe it's destroyed. And so this is like an offer, how you could, or yeah, how people could talk with their children about, uh, yeah, things like that, or so. So, yeah, does this answer the question? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you again, Catherine, you, not in just the U.S. and Germany, but in many different parts of the world. Um, are there any like specific differences to how people, children in particular, like react to those heavier parts of your play? Like the, your, the garden being washed away by a wet moth? I think this, no, that's, that's the same. I mean, it's a loss and that's, yeah, it's... Yeah. Blut for jeden. Yeah, I don't know how to say it's that. It's difficult for everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that that's the, um, if I can just, because uh, I, I think something you said is really beautiful. I think that that's actually the key for getting kids to, getting all people, but I think kids in particular, to make that connection, to build that sense of compassion, is that 
Like it's a common our common humanity, right? It's lost for everybody when that garden goes. It's it's you know my my seven year old was in the was in the audience this morning and. I, I think that this show was very layered, so there was some things he was able to walk away with and some things that, you know, will be a conversation probably in a few years mm -hmm. um, that he just didn't grasp yet. But I think the kind of common sense of like, it would be really hard to be that kid, mm -hmm. right? To have that experience, that that is like uniting. And I think helping, helping, I always think about that with my kids and students, like helping them connect to the common human experience. Like mm -hmm. you've had loss or, you've had hardship, right? You've had things that have been disappointing or scary, that those kind of common human emotions are a great entry point for, mm -hmm. for compassion. Yeah, the, um, the way that you were able to get people to connect to your show in so many, like, so many different levels and like have so much, like you rooting for this kid the whole time, but just things kept going wrong again wrong again and they lift pick themselves pick themselves back up and then they're like thrown back down like um the commander they yeah. um, they mm -hmm. came in to like, they discovered the girl in her hiding spot and she's like oh no i've been caught and then it turns out that the commander was on the run as well mm -hmm. and she's like oh i have a friend and then the commander's just snatched away mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like oh no mm -hmm. um and just like those ups and downs um, when she finally reunited with her mom in the end, it was just had me like raising my hands. That's all <laughs> I really wanted to say. I was like, yes, <laughs> I really like uh, like re like re re reuniting arts and things. Um, but transferring, I'm trying to I have these written down. Um, to Sophia, I the, a friend of mine in the crowd ask this at your show yesterday. Um, but the main character of your show, which was a life-size pu puppet that you called Ruben, um, had a camera that they would occasionally just like flash the audience or like on the large projector that you had or like parts of the set. What was the, what was the significance of that camera? We like to leave it pretty much open-ended for every person in the audience to have their own interpretation. But I can tell you my interpretation, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is um, that for me, this character um, is like a double layer that is like, his lens is revealing all these other characters and other stories. So he's like, his lens is documenting um, these stories in the show. But at the same time, I think it's very interesting. Before I used to, when we started the show, um, I used to turn to the screen and take the picture with the character towards the screen. And then at some point, Davey proposed to do it towards the audience. And then I thought that it was this double layer that he's also taking a picture of the people. Like, what are you doing while this is happening? Or that's what happens in my mind when I do yeah. that. <laughs> one, of, um, one of my friends, because uh, I invited the three of my friends, well, I invited two of my friends, and then they brought one of my other friends, and then another plus one. Um, so it was like most, many surprises. Um, but they all had different reactions, or, like ideas to what it meant. And one of them was like the, um, when he was taking photos of the audience, that was like, what are you, what's your reaction to the, like, the tragedies that's happening on screen and on set. Um, and I, I had no idea what the camera meant. I was like, I was trying to focus and like, I, I'm, I'm not the best at making questions while like a production is going on. Usually I think about it afterwards and I'm like, oh, okay. So thinking about the camera wasn't exact. I was just like, what is that? and then moved on because something else was happening. I was yeah. like, oh my gosh, what is that? <laughs> um, but my friends had several different answers. Like none of them were the same for <laughs> just the same question. What is the camera for? I love that. <laughs> yeah. I love that um, a lot of people have different interpretations, not, not just from the camera, but from mm -hmm. different things in the show. That's why it's so interesting for us to open the conversation at the end and just listen to um, people reflections and 
stories that they interpreted from the images of the show because we have few words because of the same to leave it open but um yeah the, i think it's it's uh, we have even joked about um having a real camera and taking real pictures of like the faces of the people during the show that would be incredible but it's too dark <laughs> Right. Low light camera, um, and then like one of one of in your show, one of the I think like most drawing parts of your show was the sand drawings. Just like the slow, I I kind of want to say slow burn, but a lot of the time, it wasn't always just like a slow burn. It was more of like a just like a slow wind, I guess, because um, it was it wasn't like it wasn't. I mean, the things that you were drawing was like, it was like, oh, it was emotionally like painful in some ways, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't like, it wasn't meant to invoke pain in a sense. It was just very, you're able to think and ponder on what you were drawing until it was finished. Mm. Um, what led you to wanting to choose that as, that's it, I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know if it's actually like your primary, like one of your primary ways of presenting in your works. Um, like what led you to using that and why? Um, I really fell in love with um, the material. I feel that it's such a playful material. I was always afraid of drawing in paper and it's so playful, the material that it, it made me feel less scared of being wrong. And since this first time that I tried it, I felt um, that I loved the slow motion and pace of like the ever-changing landscape, the opportunity of transforming something into something else. And I always like to layer the drawing, leaving something from the first drawing behind with a new drawing on top and just like little pieces that remind you of the drawing before and I, I really like that and I feel that it's almost like a meditation for me when I'm doing it. I um, enter this other like emotional slow space where I have a lot of space to reflect on things in a different way and I've seen with my kid, he's very energetic. Um, his name is Iñaki, that means fire and my mom is like, you can't complain that he's energetic, you put him fire. <laughs> And I see him that um, he has been in a bunch of workshops of ours and, and shows. And I see him when he is in this energetic and he starts drawing in sand, he like changes his whole emotional disposition and he like slows down. And I feel that also even just watching it, you are in a different disposition. Like when you watch the news from, for example, when I watch the news, I usually block myself emotionally like it's so much to take in that I can't really engage in the same way and I feel that the slow the slowness of the sand drawings um, allow me to engage emotionally in a you different way. You can take way. it in stride a lot better. Yeah. Like, like um, going back to what you said about like um, like it's like a meditative um, like during the first parts of the show I had I had seen like the like the, um, like the 11 minute like I don't want to say it was edited because it wasn't really edited. Um, it was just like the it was just like the first eleven minutes of the show. Mm -hmm. um, but I had already seen it, and during that those first parts of the show here, just like watching the sand drawings, I was just like drawn to it, just like as it, you, you know when you like zone out while watching TV. And no, it's not <laughs> watching TV. It's something much better than TV. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you're just drawn in to like every like stroke of your finger. And it's, like, uh, at first I thought like the way you use your hand, use it kind of as like a puppet's hand. Cause you're, you're acting as the puppet. It's like you, you wear the puppet essentially. He's the one making the drawings. <laughs> yeah, so the way you use your hand while you're drawing is also it, it adds to like the meditative or like trance-like like, effects of the sand drawings. 
and I, I loved it. Um, but transferring to once again, hold on. Um, for Chrissy, Chrissy, I have not read your book yet, un it's unfortunately. Okay. You got some time. Um, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how many in the audience have either. Could you just elaborate on some of like the spe more specific themes and practices that you wanted sure. to like <coughs> to bring to parents? Yeah. So if you if you haven't had a chance to uh, read the book, and you can get a copy at Everyone's Books um, downtown, um, uh, Angela felt really strongly that, and we all felt as we talked through that we didn't want to create a book that um, was like, here are the seven things you do to like create a change maker. Because um, I just don't think it's that simple. Ooh, and we all that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'd fix the world and none of us would be sitting yeah. here and it would be really beautiful. But that's not how it works. And so, and we, you know, every kid is different and every parent is different. And so um, in some ways, um, the book was an opportunity to just sort of share like, here are some approaches and ways that we think about parenting. Um, so, um, and in our chapter, we both sort of tell our stories, like this is who we are and how we came to care about racial justice in particular. And then here are some of the ways that we might engage children. So, you know, the, 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 throughout the book, you'll, there are sort of chapter sections where there are many conversations, like that, that actually happened. One of the conversations um, that's sort of uh, in there is a conversation that I had with a young kid um, who was, when, when I was uh, a DEI director at a school, who you know, was in the first grade and who um, another child, it was a black child, and another child called him burned popcorn. And he went home sort of really, and he tried to tell the teacher and the teacher sort of brushed it off like, eh, so first graders say, say mean things. Mm -hmm. um, and without realizing the impact that that particular phrase had on this black child in a predominantly white school. Um, and so the conversation is the conversation um, between mom and kid of like what I was called and, and why my skin is, is this dark and why my classmates are not. Um, and so really just trying to kind of model a little bit of that, like you get asked a question, how might you answer, how might this go? Um, and the book has sort of suggestions also for literature to use to engage in conversation. So there's a lot of, I think, it's a book with a lot of resource um, that you can use in a lot of different ways. Um, and uh, you know, I found that just even in writing it, it was like powerful to both kind of, Angela and I wrote separately and then came together and we were like, oh my God, our stories. It's like so fascinating the way that our stories were layered or how are some of the conversations that we had both had with our kids um, who live very different lives and you know, come from different backgrounds, but were asking similar questions. Um, yeah. And that was sort of kind of both surprising and fun, but also like, oh yeah, right? That we're all living in this and they're all living in it too. And they're, they're asking those questions. Why, why are things this way? Or um, why is my skin different? Or why are those people whose skin is different treated a different way? Um, mm -hmm. So the, the book kind of has both sample conversations, resources to use, and mm -hmm. also just some kind of, um, I would call like foundational ideas really um, about, particularly in the racial justice chapter about kind of um, uh, things like, um, I'm blanking. Sorry, I have a six week old, so sometimes my brain just stops working because I don't sleep anymore. Um, um, yeah, just some foundational, foundational kind of concepts that might help parents as they're, as they're engaging in these conversations. If it comes to me, I will spit it back out later, but it's not here now. Can people buy the book online? You can also buy the book online. <laughs> yes, if you're not in Brattleboro at Everyone's Books, you can get that book online anywhere you get your books, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so much, um, so much of what you were specifically saying it, like keeps reminding me like back to my childhood, like with my mom and stuff. Um, this is mostly like a, a story that my mom like tells to me again occasionally. Um, but, like one day when I was, I think I was in like yeah kindergarten or first grade, I came home. I like told mom like I can't remember whether it was a like, kid or like one of the teachers. Like, I was probably I can't remember exactly the context. Um, but, uh, and this could be like, like me trying to like insert something in my memory so that it makes <laughs> sense. Um, but like, you know, like, you know, those like surveys that you sometimes take as a kid that are yes. just like, choose, like, what's your, what's your race? Like, I do know black those. And white. <laughs> um, and I wanted, it was either that or like, 
someone like insisted that I was black. And when I when I was younger, my mom was very much like, you can choose like what what you want to be labeled as, and I want to be labeled as mixed. Um, my dad's white, my mom is black, um, and like I can't remember whether it was like the teacher or like student that was there who was like, no, you have to you have to like you have to pick one. It wasn't li it wasn't listed there, and you have to pick one. I was like, it's it, I, it's not there. <laughs> so I, like, I, I'm guessing I like came home and let mom know about it, and I don't remember whether she did if she did anything about it. If I, rem I if I know her, she probably did. <laughs> um, but yeah, I um, I don't remember it very well at all. But she does. Yeah. So. But those moments are so formative, right? Like mm -hmm. we. So I think so many of us can remember some of these moments. Um, and actually, funny you say that because there's I, the, one of the stories I tell in the book is a similar story of like getting one of those questions and having to pick a box and feeling like none of the boxes described me and going home and asking my mom. And her answer, you have to read this book to find out, but her answer was sort of outrageous. And so part of my story in the book is like the ways in which whiteness really, um, the ways in which sort of white supremacy convinces us that whiteness is the answer, right? And that if we can check white, that's the best box to check. Um, um, and how we, how we kind of help kids sort of break that down. Um, but one of the things in the book is also, because I think your, your piece about like, we have to help our kids feel agency, right? It's scary, it's, it's hard for adults, like the news, right? Like it's hard for it's us. It's hard, yeah. And so like we have to help kids feel, I really think it's really important that they feel a sense of joy and agency and that like social change feels like exciting and positive. Um, and not all really sad and depressing because then no one will do anything. We'll all jump off the bridge. Um, <laughs> I would too. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that's in the that's in that chapter is just like there's this great um, biracial children's like Bill of Rights, which is like you have the choice <clears throat> to choose whatever identity you want, right? Like no one gets to tell you. Um, you have the choice to kind of change that over time as you learn about yourself. And I, and my my children, you know, my husband's white, so my I share that with my children. Like you have a lot of space and choice, and people will see you as something and name you as something, um, but they don't get to do that. You get to do that. Um, and so really in the book, we try to sort of hold that, like, here's the reality, but here's also ways to do that to help kids feel empowered, like getting them to know activists and artists, having them see works, right, where they ha can figure out what's my avenue, how do I make a change, maybe it's, maybe it's through art, maybe I'm, that's my avenue, uh, maybe it's through something else, maybe it's through storytelling, right, like really making sure that kids feel like they have agency in it all and that it's not all doom and gloom, because mm -hmm. that's not and very isn't it like I was just um, yeah. wondering um, that, like, one main point is that um, you, that, like, the kids or everyone uh, learns that every person is different. Yeah. Like, there's no no uh, cupboard things. Yeah. No boxes. Right. And there's like no groups. Like even the white, we are not one box. And there's right. it's such a so many different people. And that you, if you meet somebody, that you always be interested in the person that is like they in front of you mm -hmm. and that doesn't matter what it looks like and yeah of course we have um, the older we get the more um, experience, experiences we have and of course we take it with us and then we try to look at somebody according to these experiences but I think we lose so much or we miss so much if we just stick to what we have, because we, we meet somebody new, yeah, and so it's, it's worth looking at them, yeah. like, as somebody new, mm -hmm. and that, that's maybe something it's worth um, giving the kids as well, yeah. you know, yeah. don't, don't try to make boxes, although it's easier, or it mm -hmm. seems to be easier. We miss so much. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's so, yeah and have respect for all these differences. I mean, it's not like how I do it, that's like the right way to do it. It's like the range of possibilities. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I think, yeah, that's what was just yeah. Yeah, yeah, connecting that. with what you said. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely like, um, I've noticed in like my, oh God, oh, there goes my computer. Um, cannot hold the charge. Um, I've noticed in like my age groups, like being labeled as normal is more or like, like
like a normie is more of an insult now. It's like, oh, how you're like boring. <laughs> you just <laughs> there's like there's um, being labeled as like different or strange or weird is now more <laughs> of a like. I mean, of course, it's still like that's kind of weird. <laughs> it's it's. It's more in like endearing in some ways, endearing being like in friend groups and such. So that that's where that applies. But also just, it's not labeled as like an insult as much anymore. It's not as offensive. Um, like that's I think it's certainly progress. When I was younger, like someone would call me weird. Um, I think I'm more self-conscious now than I was when I was a kid. So now I I take it it more to heart. But I was like, why, thank you. <laughs> um, when someone would call me strange. Um, but like, yeah, meeting meeting new people is, if you never meet a new person in your life, like you, you're gonna get stuck in the same ways over and over again. And either you like become kind of infinitely content with a situate with your situation that might not be the best and you don't know a, another one mm. um, and don't want to leave that one for fear that it's worse or that it's just uncomfortable not even really worse um, you, you don't you don't you don't leave that spot um, and for everyone else it's boring <laughs> <laughs> Not just like like people looking in. Just like you don't want to do like you don't want to do. That's people know that that's like an incredible thing to go do. Like skydiving. Like I guess skydiving is kind of a bad example because people people are just afraid of heights. That's you know it, <laughs> death that <laughs> happens from falling. Um, but also people know that it, it's like. Going skydiving is, at least like in 99% of the time, like a safe experience. Like people help you and are trained professionals and you can jump off of that. <laughs> yeah, the, my, my, my mom and my grandfather did that. Uh, and I was like, yeah, but, the, um, but then at the same time, this is another example. Um, at the, at the uh, like an amusement park once, um, the my like my child sitter and my mom well my mom wanted to go on on like a bungee cord ride like it was I don't know how many feet tall it was just two enormous beams and then like a globular cage in the center like gigantic like wire bungee cords just connected to and we walked up to it and I was like Nope. <laughs> and I mean, of, of course it's safe. Um, my mom was like, come on, let's go on. And I was like, no way. <laughs> that, I've never seen anything like this before. This it looks like, this is completely new. I'm, I'm like afraid you're gonna launch up into the sky <laughs> and never come back. Um, so she took my child sitter begrudgingly with her so she could go. And I mean, she had a blast, but I was freaking out the entire time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then, so like kind of um, moving on, um, like one last question before we go to audience Q&A. Um, the, this was, this is like organic, like a, just a question that I got just like talking to y'all now. Um, with the, the survey that I referenced earlier, it brought me back to um, the survey that you present in your show, mm -hmm. Sophia. Um, the one that non-US citizens have to go through to get into the US. Mm -hmm. um, very questionable questions on that, <laughs> that had just people, not just me, but like many people in the audience, just like confused about, just like <laughs> why? Would anyone even need to ask these questions? Mm -hmm. Me, um, me, I, um, I expressed this to you like, right after our interview. I was like, you could just say no. <laughs> it's like, or you could just say, 
Yeah, but no. Was, why would anyone say yes to these questions? Mm. Yeah. Even if they had you couldn't be done that some of these kid. things? <laughs> it didn't make any sense. Yeah. There was like, 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 uh, of, of course, like, like 99% of the people had, had done none of these things. But you could just say yes and there's... And then not come. You, and then yeah. not yeah. come yeah. ever. <laughs> <laughs> But Sorry, it, people will just say no. <laughs> it's like, no, I've never done any of these things. <laughs> but they're so bizarre, and they present those. You, say, you were saying that they present these questions to every single person that comes in, even, even small kids. children. Yeah. yeah. Please, like, elaborate. Like, let us know some of those questions. Or just like elaborate on like some of, like the system. And Why? and the ones we have in the show, they're just a, a bit an extract of like a very long, long, long questionnaire. Mm. Uh, but yeah, like, uh, like, let, like, if if you're comfortable, like, let us know some of those questions. <laughs> Maybe Davy knows them in memory because huh? he tells them every show. <laughs> sure. But oh, yeah, so yeah. are you a terrorist? Are you trafficking drugs? Are you kidnapping people? Are you using child soldiers? Are you doing political killings? And are so you coming to be a prostitute? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Have you been involved in prostitution or are you planning to get involved in it while in the United States? <laughs> very repetitive and sometimes with an un, uh, unclear, correct response, mm -hmm. some because of the wording. So I think there's a lot of intentional confusion mm -hmm. in the questionnaire. Mm -hmm. I was asked if I had an intention to kill the president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Direct question. Who the president is. Is Thirty something years ago in St. Albans, Vermont, and I looked at this man and I was shocked. shocked. And I think I said no. <laughs> I think you did too. Which was a lie. Like, and then, no. I, and then <laughs> just for a funny class. story, they took my fingerprint. And there was not a lot of a print, and he said, "What are you doing professionally?" And I didn't say puppeteer. I said, "I'm a professional thumb sucker." <laughs> <laughs> and Eric was sitting next to me, and he thought, "That's it." Okay. They're out. never gonna love it. <laughs> I couldn't because I had to respond to the stupidity of these things. It was rising me the anger yeah. and the stupidity that yeah. I had yeah. to come out with something like this. But it's a real risk to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to oh, yeah. keep your emotions in check mm -hmm. so much yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. because yes. that will just kill your chance. Mm -hmm. yeah. totally. right. And mm -hmm. I was lucky because it's so long ago. Mm -hmm. I couldn't mm -hmm. do this now. And you were white, a white European. And I was a white yeah. European. That makes a big difference. Yeah. 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 Actually, even when you, when you like me, yeah, I'm for five days. I'm now in the U.S. and um, I had to ask uh, answer a lot of these questions just for the flight and for the visa and. Um, yeah, then finally, knew I, I got my visa as I'm yeah, here. here. And, um, <laughs> and then there was this um, sentence, don't try to be funny when you're there at the border. Oh. You know, oh. <laughs> that will be it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, no humor. No, no joy. No yeah, it's just humor. <laughs> it's a serious. No joy. <laughs> from the audience that we have, if there are any. Well, uh, coming off of the thing that you just said, um, did, it, did that interaction with having to uh, obtain the visa to, to come to the States um, alter the way that you viewed your show at all, mm. since it is about border crossing? Mm. Actually, I thought that these questions are so absurd. Mm. I, I can't take them for real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't answer any with yes. Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm not from the mafia, and I'm you know <laughs> not. I'm not uh, good at uh, building uh, bombs yeah. or things. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I didn't kill anyone, and I'm not Jeez. big time in drugs. So, but yeah. Actually, I think it's a bit silly. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, I, no, it didn't affect my work 
bit, mm. yeah, it's mm. just a different cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> A moment from your show that I keeps coming up to me that I didn't realize was going to be so profound, but I keep thinking about it, so it must be sticking. Uh, and it's the thank you moment mm. mm -hmm. where we're all on the mat. And mm. just for anyone who didn't see the show, where the, she asks audience members to come mm. and sit on the uh, beds that have been cut out for the refugee children. And I, I sat, my son is next to me on this other mat. Mm. And we all are handed the toys, uh, slips of paper that are meant to be toys, and then to say thank you for the toys, but we're not saying it the way you want. Mm. And then you get upset about it. Mm -hmm. Can you speak about how that, because I know that it comes from a book, but to, to create, because I was thinking to myself, well, I'm an adult in this moment sitting on this mat because there's not a lot of kids at the show today. But there normally would probably be a child yeah. here. How do you do that scene with a child the same way? Yeah. yeah. How does that go? Um, normally, like the kids, they sit like. Oh, they laugh. Yeah. yeah. Right, because it's yeah. uncomfortable yeah. a little. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. of course. Yeah. The whole situation is kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. They yeah. go there and say, hey, hey, I'm sitting here. Do you see me? Right. Kind of. Right. You know? uh -huh. And then when, when I go and say, look, these are refugee children, they go, Ooh. Yeah. And then I go, mm -hmm. you know, uh -huh. so, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's like that, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the build of the scene, too, I also, I, like, I keep thinking about how we're not saying it the way you mm -hmm. want. Mm -hmm. How did, how did you dramaturgically come to the, come to the realization, because I feel like it's such, it's such a powerful moment, a powerful theatrical moment mm -hmm. to build the scene the way you do and then to end it the way that you did. Did it? Is that straight from the book, or did you come no. through it with with a, a dramaturg or someone? No, it's like um, yeah. I mean, in in the book, it's um, uh, more absurd. Like there's a whole bunch of uh, parents coming with their children, the children crying, and they have to give their toys oh, away. Yeah. You know, you do that. You know, you want to give that, oh. and I say, no, I don't. So. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think for me or for us, it was this balance because, um, I mean, there's so many people that really work um, voluntarily yeah. and do it very much from the heart mm -hmm. and they are very um, empathetic and do it like that. Mm -hmm. And then there's people who do it that somebody says, oh, you're doing a good job. Oh, so many, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. so like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah. like, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm helping, so I'm better than somebody else, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. and I even help more, and, and this, mm -hmm. I think, one, one important thing about, thing about helping is uh, not um, uh, erwarten, Expectation, Ex no expectations. Yeah, to have not the expectation yeah. that somebody says, oh, thank you, that's, you know, because you want to help, so then help, you know, and this person there is in a miserable situation, mm -hmm. so that's miserable already, so they don't need you to be there, you yeah, know, I need, you know, some, some response on what I did, you know, so, and that was kind of the, mm -hmm. yeah, this balance to have these two, yeah? It's so real for me. Yeah, and that's like... And also to, to have a child have to deal with a crazy adult. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Because so often, yeah. you know, we as, our, as parents, mm -hmm. I'm a parent as well, we're trying to um, be stable for our kids, right? We want to, to model like stability, but then sometimes the, that can't happen. And then to have... I don't know, it was just such a good moment. I think I'm just still processing it. And yeah, and I think lot. one one part as well is that sometimes uh, people, you know, they, they help, and but the situation is so crazy, and there's so many people, yeah. and so they mm. are um, überfordert. Overwhelmed. They are overwhelmed, and then they do things they won't do. Yeah. Like she is ex exploding, and, mm -hmm. and then she realizes what she just said. Yeah. And she's like, oh God, mm -hmm. I, I didn't want that, uh, uh, but, but now it's out, mm -hmm. you know. And that's like another situation to be, yeah, 
to get a feeling for, for this situation as well. Like, yeah, for the refugee children, but mm -hmm. for the other side as well. Mm -hmm. I think because she was abroad, maybe too. I appreciated it mm -hmm. because it felt real. Anyway. Can I ask a question right there? Uh, I got so annoyed about this lady, I wanted to scream into the audience, I am not going to say thank you, you're stupid. And I didn't dare to say that because I was afraid I would interrupt the flow of the show. And I wasn't sure if you were uh, kind of prepared for these kind of things. I would have answered something. You would have? <laughs> so you know, you have, did you have that, that situation? No. No, interesting. Thank you. She oh could now. It's right now. Right. I it's was so up. angry and I thought, no, no, I'm not going to interrupt the show. Oh. <laughs> right. I love that. You the wall you were yes. I was in the, I was one of the people sitting down for your show earlier. And um, during the show, I was trying to like, I like actually like adopt the part of like the child. Of, I wasn't doing the best child. Oh, doing best as child. I mean, maybe the best as a refugee child. Um, haven't been in, haven't had that experience. Um, but definitely when like you had that last outburst, like that like genuinely shook me. Like mm -hmm. as that kid, that put me in that character's shoes for mm -hmm. a second. Mm -hmm. Genuinely, mm -hmm. like it, it was powerful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, well, I was just going to say, it translates to other situations, whether the child is on welfare or in mm -hmm. foster home. Mm -hmm. um, there's just ways where there's imbalance, mm -hmm. you know, there's this abundance of wealth and then lacking scarcity, but how to give appropriately. So you're, there's, it's empowering, not debilitating to people. Mm -hmm. Both. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I I think um, like we we don't I I'm I don't have a piece uh, especially about social justice as far as I know mm -hmm. maybe it's in some story mm -hmm. I tell but but I'm I'm it's ex explicit that we don't have it but in general I think um, to not be like very hard on stage, but do an offer, and then it should happen in the audience. So, and that's for me, that's like the best way to do it. You know, mm -hmm. I can I can present things, and then but the rest is uh, happening in the audience. And uh, the less I press mm -hmm. to put, you know, what I think and what they should think. The, the more I step back from that, the more happens, mm -hmm. because there's like a place to right. to yeah. So, mm -hmm. no. um, the inspiration for this migraciones migrations is our first show in the company, and the inspiration was definitely coming from our fear of the increasing border tensions between our countries and being like, well, maybe one day the pot of tension will explode and then maybe we cannot see each other ever again or maybe the company cannot continue and all these worries that sometimes we still have. Um, so that was like the origin that we need to talk about this and 
that's how we try to put an autobiographical part, but also trying to to make justice to all these other people and stories that go through that all the time, all around the world. Um, so we kind of, you know, our story brought us to that story. So it wasn't um, thought like a social justice, but it ended up um, touching some some of that. Um, our next show is more about. Um, it's kind of related because it's about neighbors that cannot understand each other because they are very different and um, they don't have a common language to understand each other and they have it's about loneliness and proximity mm -hmm. and how it has to do of course with the pandemic of course not not direct directly but I feel it's related with our experience during the pandemic mm -hmm. and how they can um, overcome their differences to be able to communicate and overcome mm. the complications in their community. Mm. So it is implied, but it's not. We, we don't think it from the social justice point of view, but it always ends up, mm -hmm. up touching it. Um, and I feel that our choice to have few words is actually to not try to make it, you know, di didactic is the word. Mm -hmm. um, um, the new show, for example, won't have any words, and our intention is exactly to make even more extreme the possibility to have your own interpretation of things and the story, and to make it more universal and accessible to all audiences. Mm. Um, but it, it was definitely difficult to choose which words we were actually gonna use, for example, in Migraciones, um, to try to not because we don't have the, I feel like we don't have the answers. We don't have all the answers. We have found some maybe for ourselves or for our own worries. Mm -hmm. um, but we are not trying to teach, this is how you should think about migration and this is how we solve the global crisis, mm -hmm. um, the constant exodus around the world, right? Um, so we were trying to find the right words to to not be didactic, but also to question yourself mm -hmm. and your points of view of all that. Mm -hmm. If Very that makes sense. sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's nice so answers, like nice. giving offers to the audience mm -hmm. and having the audience do their own teaching. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, their own like homework. Exactly. Yeah, and that's what I think, what yeah. theater is about. You yeah. know, like we have the stage and we can, you know, try and make offers and mm. do different things so it's not dangerous you know if you do it always in the society it would be dangerous but we can try and then the audience ha has a look and says okay but mm. that means woo or ah yes maybe mm. and so yeah mm. I think that's that's uh, yeah that's mm. why I love theatre mm. <laughs> mm. mm. me too yeah, yeah. <laughs> It reminds me of a question I would like to ask you is just on this topic like when you were all naming your book Parenting for Social Justice, in a sense it like addresses people who are interested in that and want to do that. How do you feel you can open up that? Like do you think somebody who's who on whose radar social justice is not there? But who would so benefit from you know those topics? Yeah, mm. that's a great question. So um, the book was named like the project was named before I kind of entered it, um, and and I and I will what I can speak to is a little bit of my experience. So um, when the book um, came out, um, I was working in a very conservative space um, at a very conservative school, uh, and so there was a lot of conversation about. Um, generally, they sort of announce like, "Oh, we have a faculty member who has a text. Uh, do we do we say that our this faculty member has this text because this title is triggering to our audience?" Um, which I was like, "Do what you want. Like, I, I, the book is done. Like, I don't really, care. I don't really care. Um, and I'm doing I'm doing this work here. Y'all are missing the point that like that's what's happening out of this office. But that's on them. Um, and interestingly, I." Um, in that time frame, kind of came to be friendly with some parents um, who uh, 
would not be interested in a book with such a title at all. Um, but um, as they were talking about the things that were coming up for their kids and the things that they were worried about in the world, um, I happen to say like, hey, it's totally self plug here. There's this book, right, that I actually think, um, while you might not like the title, I think you might find on the inside some ways to think about these questions you're asking about, about how to talk to your kids. Because um, really, I think um, the book is very much giving us space to think about how do I engage my kids in topics that are complex, that are difficult, um, that I that that um, I think that are that are sad and scary and hard for me as an adult and maybe for my kids, um, and so that was a that was an entry point and and many of those people reluctantly got the book <laughs> and then I heard from them like oh when I heard social justice I thought X Y Z that I see on this news channel um, but this is not actually quite what you're talking about you're talking about talking about difficult. Um, and they found parts of it useful. There were, you know, they certainly had things they were like, I don't agree with your take on X, Y, Z. So totally fine. We don't have to agree. Actually, I think that's good. I think that's where we have conversation. But um, I do think, yeah, the title is not, I don't think folks are just going to pick it up um, if, you're, if that's already a trigger word for you. Um, but I do think that there's, there's um, it, it will speak to a, a wider audience than maybe um, initially think it does. By the title, but it's a very good point. Yeah, I'm. Mean, you know, I think um, the workshops were named that, and so it was like a natural progression for the mm -hmm. book to have the same the name to be recognizable. Mm -hmm. But it's a good point. All right, I'm gonna pass to Shoshana to like, wrap it up. All right. Wow. Mm -hmm. Stick. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. You Um, I thank you so much for facilitating this beautiful conversation and. Thank you to our beautiful panelists. Just saying again for everyone, the book is at for sale at um, everyone's books here in Brattleboro, or you can find it online. You can see a whole website online. Yeah, yes, you can oh. see a whole website at Parenting for Justice. It's very exciting. Um, and please check out the work of both Paradox Teatro and Weitschweicher Theater. And do, do your online research. Um, those of you that are here, I hope you're coming to the show tonight if you weren't there yesterday or joining the workshop tomorrow and or joining the workshop tomorrow. Um, please check in on the rest of the festival. But thank you for being here. I think this is where some of the most exciting work happens and some of the most exciting connections are made because really, I think in the end, humanity, social change, whatever word you want to call about how we operate together in the world in a more peaceful and sustainable and thriving way is inextricably linked with, with art and how we practice that in the world. And I feel like we need each other always and forever. Um, and anyone who thinks those are two separate things, <laughs> maybe you should think again because it keeps coming up. So um, thank you for participating. Let the conversation ripple out into the rest of the world and into the rest of the festival and to all you at home. Um, thank you very much. See you at the next event. Closer and we could converse more, but the internet is what that's for.